right. Hi, Becky. How are you? Hello. There we go. Hello. We'll just wait a few minutes for uh, it looks like we have okay. so tonight's meeting just to update everybody is um to get a um an update from the 2021 recipients um and we'll um go through hey nate um let them um present for like approximately three minutes or so. And then um, we can ask any questions we have. And then we have just a little bit of business to take care of at the end. All right, Judith, I see your hands raised. We can, uh, you can unmute yourself. Hi, um, I just wanted to know if we could go on early in the meeting because I have a board member and a student here and the student has to return to her family. Sure, we, I think you can go first. Um, let me just um, get the meeting called to order and everything, and then we'll bring you back in, okay? Thank you. I can't see the audience, so I'm assuming they're, they've arrived, but I don't know. It looks like, um, I don't know, we have... We could wait like two minutes maybe, just to see if who else joins us. And are we, Nate, going to be able to see people when they, can we promote them to panelists so that they can? We oh, can yeah, yeah, them? I guess that's a great idea. We could okay. uh, promote whoever's speaking to a panelist and then they can. Oh, good, and that's here. Hey, Nat. Hello, everyone. Um, all right, well, I will go ahead and call the meeting to order so that we can start talking. Let me just do our little official. Um, okay, the time is now 7.02, and seeing as a quorum of committee members is in attendance, this public hearing is being called to order. So I welcome everybody to the April 19th, 2023 public hearing of the Amherst Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by the state legislature on July 16th of 2022, this meeting is being conducted virtually using the Zoom platform. The meeting is being recorded and minutes are being taken as usual. And if we can do a roll call um, and just, if you can just speak for, to say hello so we can make sure everybody's audio is working. Um, I'll just call on Suzanne. Hi, Suzanne Schilling. Great, and Rika. Yes, present Rika Clement. And Lucas. Lucas Hanscom, present. Great, and Nat. Yes, Nat Larson, present. I apologize, I haven't eaten dinner yet, so I may go um, off screen for a while, uh, but I'll still be here. Okay, no problem. Going off screen to eat, I hope not just to faint with hunger. Yes, do. Um, and I'm Becky Michaels, I'm here, and Nate is here. And um, so tonight what we're going to be doing is um, getting reports from um, the 2021 grant recipients. And um, I see a bunch of you in attendance. Thank you so much for coming tonight. We also did receive um, your reports. And so we're gonna ask for you to um, present to us, you know, approximately three minutes, um, and then we'll ask questions if we have them. Um, and then 
um, as I just said to the to the group here, we have a little bit of business to take care of at the end that's mostly just logistics. Um, although one of the, the things that I do wanna talk about um, is that our we don't really need to have another meeting anytime soon specifically, but I thought what we might do is use our um, time that we would have spent in a meeting doing site visits for um, different organizations that might be willing to give us a tour of their facility and just sort of show us a little bit of, of what the work is looking like on the ground. Um, so um, I would just ask if any of the organizations um, and people who are here presenting tonight have um, would not be able to do that or would welcome doing that, just let us know that as part of your presentation and I'll remind you as well um, if we don't get to that. So um, why don't we let um, Judith, do you want to go first? I don't know, do you want to, what are the names of, if we can bring Judith in and she can tell us the names of the people she's here with. Yeah, we can see if anyone's here for the literacy project, you can just raise your hand and then we could promote you to panelists. Hi, I'm Judith Hi. Roberts. Hi, Judith. And I'm, thank you. Um, I, I want to extend my sincere gratitude to the town for funding the literacy project and our adult education classes. And we are currently running our classes online. So we would love to have any members of the committee or Nathaniel um, join. And um, I'd be happy to send you a Zoom link for that. Um, I would like to give a chance to um, Fakria, one of our students who I'm hoping is in the audience um, to speak on behalf of the Literacy Project. And she's here as a panelist in Fakria. Thank you so much for being here. You can either stay off screen or come on, whichever you prefer, but we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. <coughs> Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, I'm actually, I want to turn off my camera because my kid is around, so I don't want to bother anyone. <laughs> um, so would you like to turn on my camera or that's fine? However you're most comfortable, off is completely fine. Okay, so yeah, thank you. So I'm Fahriya and I'm originally from Afghanistan and I live in Amherst. I want to share my experience with the literacy project. So. As you know, every person has a goal in life to reach the highest of success. As a literacy project to students, I want to say that I found the way, the light to the way that brings my, me closer to my goal in literacy project. When I arrived in the United States and I didn't know any English as well, I only knew the basic. So my life was very hard, new environments, different traditions, different language, I felt like a bird, bird with a wings, like I wanted to fly, but I couldn't. So until I found the literacy project and started my lessons with the kindness teacher, every day I had hope by reading and going to the literacy project. After a lot of hard work, I was able to learn the language to the extent that I can solve my problem in, the, in today's society. So now I can speak in English and I can make friends. It doesn't matter which language it is, but I'm able to learn an English language. But this did not cause me to stop from the main goal. Learning the language motivated me to learn more and better and to think about other goals, such as going to college. So once again, the literacy project helped me to continue my studies and prepare for college. The literacy project has provided students with a chance to get a high school degree if they pass the exam in subjects such as math, reading, science, social study, or writing and writing. So uh, fortunately, uh, with the great effort of the teachers from literacy project and employees of the literacy project, I was able to pass for four subjects but there is one subject left that I'm still working on it so that I can achieve my main goal, uh, which is going to uh, college, that's my main goal. So needless to say, everything I learned in the United States was from the help and effort of the literacy project. Today I'm speaking in English and I'm getting ready to go, co to, go to college. That's a big change in my life. So I shared my story and experience today with you 
so that you all know that the literacy project is one of the best community that always values the development and progresses of students so that they achieve their academic goals. And I want to say thanks to everyone who support the literacy project for everything. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And what amazing work you've done. Thank you so much. Oh, for thank you, Fakria. You're welcome. Thank you for all of you. Thank you. Incredible achievements. Um, I also have a board member, Lisa Bonwell Williams, who's a resident of Amherst. Um, and I don't know if we've used up our time yet or not. No, no, you're you have a you're good. You can bring okay. it in. Yeah. Lisa, you'll be asked to um, enter as a panelist. Becky, sometimes when you speak, it's you're you're kind of soft. I don't know if you're oh. speaking to your microphone or not or okay. Let me. Okay, that should do it. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, well, I mean, the, after after that wonderful testimony we just heard, there's almost nothing that I could say. But um, as an Amherst resident, it's so easy to just default to the sense that this is an educated community, and uh, people can fall through the cracks so easily. And yet I know that some of my neighbors and probably some neighbors of all of yours have for a variety of reasons not achieved the educational uh, attainments that they, that they would like to. And it's so gratifying to have an organization like the Literacy Project who can fill those spaces um, to offer the educational advantages for everybody from people who need really basic literacy in the most literal sense um, through college prep kind of stuff. Um, uh, and I, I just was looking over the uh, report that Judith did and well over half of the uh, students in, in the Amherst program are in fact immigrants and the potential is enormous. But an organization like the Literacy Project is essential to allow people to develop their capabilities and also just to pass the basic tests to to hit the, the benchmarks that we require of people in our culture to achieve career success and to participate in the community as active, enthusiastic and content members. And those are the people that we want all around us and the Literacy Project lets that happen. So everything you can do is much, much appreciated by a great many people. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you all. So Judith, you have about a minute to um, fill in anything else that you'd like to fill in. Oh, okay. If I have a minute, I, I will take it. Um, so please, um, well, Nathaniel knows how to get a hold of me. So please contact me if you want to attend one of our classes. We would love to have um, any members of the committee sit in. Um, and uh, I just would tell you really quickly about today, we had one of our in-person meetings and it was Science Day at the JCA um, space that we use. And um, um, students were, um, there was all these different stations set up and we welcome students to bring their kids. Our students are adults and because it's school vacation. So they did come with kids and they did, uh, blood pressure, both active and resting. They made um, roller coasters for marbles. They wrote secret messages with invisible ink that they made. So it was science day and there were all these different stations. They learned about um, mimicry in nature for predators and prey. And um, it was just a lot of fun and a lot of learning and um, a great day. So, so thank you guys for the wonderful support you've given us to be able to do all this. Thanks, Judith. I have a question. Thank I don't you. know if anybody else has any. I was wondering, can you hear me better? Does it make a difference? Okay. Um, so Judith, you said you had in, in, uh, in-person learning today, but is everything else pretty much on Zoom? And are, are there plans to bring it back in person? Yes, yes. So 
Um, I think I shared with um, Nathaniel that um, we lost our full-time lease at the JCA, and um, but we are looking for space. Um, and of course, I'm sure you understand that Amherst rent is is hard for a small nonprofit. And that's true in Northampton too, but in Northampton, we have a city owned building, but that we're in with the other, with um, Center for New Americans who are our partners, by the way. And um, they, um, so, but in Amherst, we are looking for a new space. Yeah. And, um, um, but we do still use the JCA and, and we have a good relationship and we still use them when we can. And um, teachers also meet one-on-one -on -one with students in coffee shops in town because the advising and the one-on-one -on -one is a very important part of our program. But if you can attend a Zoom class, you will see that they're lively and um, have a sense of community. Great, thank you so much. Does anybody else have any questions? Well, thank you, Judith. And thanks for bringing- I Lisa think Nate was saying something. Oh, oh yeah, sorry, um, not really a question, but just a, a comment. I was astounded by the more than 12 countries you listed um, where your students, your immigrant students have originated. And I think that's just amazing work that you're able to do, uh, welcoming people from so many different places. And I just want to clarify in case there's a question in anyone's mind, we are not an ESOL program. So students come to us, they can already speak English, but as Fakria said, it wasn't good enough for her to pass the high school equivalency test. So we, we do have what we call English language learners, which is a, at a higher level than the, um, the ESOL classes, you know, getting ready for college. and. Um, so, um, but students do have to learn English either at one of the ESOL programs, you know, the English for speakers of other languages. Um, people learn, some people learn from TV with subtitles. I mean, people learn all different ways. But thank, yes, well, you, we have a large immigrant community that really enriches the um, city of Amherst. Okay, thanks Judith. Have a good night. Thank you. Right. It looks like Laura is raising her hand. Right. Hey, Laura, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. I, I in the past that's how we've we've presented is by raising our hand. So I just figured I'd do that. Is that the process that tonight? It, sure. It, I can make you a panelist if you don't mind. And then okay. Um I would be able to, but sorry, my um zooms. Oh, there we go. Okay. Hello. <laughs> uh, yes. Hi. Thank you for funding um, our program. Um, this past quarter, we served 37 households, which was 112 beneficiaries, which means everybody in the family, because obviously if we can't help someone uh, with their housing and they become homeless, everybody becomes homeless. Uh, 20 of those families uh, first came to us because of the town emergency funds. We um, do the intakes for the emergency funds. We have an agreement with the town to do those, which is a natural um, partnership given that we do the, the uh, emergency housing support um, to keep folks housed. Uh, and it's been, it, that has been a really great partnership because it definitely brings more folks who really need our help in the door. Um, and we, what we found is that we then tend to work with those folks, many of them beyond just helping them fill out 
forms and uh, get their paperwork together to be eligible for the emergency funds. Um, what sometimes folks aren't eligible, but we can still help them in other ways. Um, and then uh, we've had a couple of cases where we had one very young mom, a single mom who's 17 years old, um, who had a long trauma history and um, had, uh, had fled domestic violence and was really struggling to stabilize her life. But um, we helped in lots of different ways. We helped her find a job. Uh, we helped her with a household budget. She had no furniture in, in her um, apartment except a bed. Um, she and her baby were just basically sitting on the bed. And so we were able through um, donations to help her get her whole apartment um, furnished. So uh, there's lots of ripples that have come from this program that I'm really um, proud of that I think really helped the citizens of Amherst in lots of ways on uh, not only just making sure that they don't become homeless. Um, what else? I guess ask me questions if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I read the report. It all sounds like you're just doing such great and important work. Does anybody have any specific questions? Actually, I have a, yeah, <clears throat> that kind of general question. The um, uh, Massachusetts uh, COVID um, uh, era um, housing restrictions and eviction restrictions, um, those expired, I believe. Have you seen impact of that? And what? how do you assess that? Yeah, I mean, that's, but they've been lifted uh, for quite a long time now. Um, and so, uh, yes, we had a real, quite a flood of folks that were struggling. Um, uh, we didn't lose any anyone. We nobody got evicted. We were able to help everybody, um, which was great. It. I mean, judges were very, very cautious to evict folks because of COVID COVID related issues. So uh, there was there's certainly that as well. But we were able to find uh, we were able to get help for everybody. Um, yeah, I think that the biggest issue that's hitting folks now, we're seeing folks that never had problems paying their rent before. So people who lived paycheck to paycheck, but were getting by, you know, but then, but they were one crisis, right? I mean, you know, you have a job where you literally depend on a paycheck every week to pay your rent and your child gets sick and you have to stay home. And so you can't work that week. There's no unemployment for one week off, but it does set you back. So those are the kind of things. And then things like the high cost of gas and the high cost of food and people who are on the edge have kind of fallen over that edge. And I mean, that's one of the reasons why survival center is so important. Um, and I would say why we're so important, because if there's a, a short term crisis like that, we can often step in and help. We have you know, volunteers that can help with things. And um, there's the emergency fund and there's, you know, there's short-term help and, and it's really making sure folks get to us and get that help and know about the survival center. And because it's a, it's a kind of a group of people who didn't utilize those services and now they are. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm sure in survival centers reports, their numbers have jumped and our numbers have jumped of just, you know, things that, folks that were used to getting by are not getting by anymore. Laura, if we wanted to come and do some sort of a site visit, does that make sense for your organization? Is there like a place to come or would it be? Well, um, uh, it would be, it'd be boring because all of the, <laughs> the case workers are out in the field. But saying that, I think we probably could arrange to have somebody that we've worked with um, and who's comfortable meet with a couple committee members. We've done that in the past with okay. other, you know. And we could also even, I think, you know, meet with caseworkers even and just sort of hear about their, you know, that might be an easier. Um, yeah. An easier yes. thing to do and, and just sort of hear about the a day in the life, you know, might yeah. be a great thing to do. Yes, you'd be most welcome to do okay. that. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, take care. Bye.
right, Lev, I see your hands raised, so we'll um, promote you to panelist. I see there's Amherst Community Connections also has their hand raised for the, the next um, presentation. go. Hi, thanks. Sorry, not sure why that took me a minute to figure out how to <laughs> how to rejoin. Um, yeah, thanks so much for giving this opportunity to share some updates. Um, I really echo a lot of what Laura was just sharing in terms of um, certainly the surging numbers that we're seeing at the Amherst Survival Center and also the prevalence of folks accessing us for the very first time and kind of people navigating resources and um, just have to really appreciate the folks at Family Outreach of Amherst for some really incredible connections and collaborations that have been able to happen and really, um, you know, just sort of the cross support that I think is able to really hold a family that's a beautiful thing. So um, really appreciate that. Um, my, yeah, so to share a little bit more of an update, um, I talked some about the trends that we were seeing in February um, when we had that meeting specifically about the recommended funding levels. And I think my update at this juncture is sort of fortunately and unfortunately very similar. Um, fortunately, and then I think we have adapted in a bunch of really key ways that are turning out to be really uh, successful, but very unfortunate in that the numbers that were soaring in February have just gotten that much worse or that much higher. And um, we're also really contending with some other key challenges at this point. Uh, March was another record breaking month for the food pantry and that we served more people in the month of March than we have ever served in any month before. Um, we are consistently seeing about 25% more people every month than during the peak surges of the pandemic um, and about 65% more than we were prior to COVID. And an additional challenge that we're really grappling with is food sourcing. Um, so due to supply chain issues and huge issues that that has caused with USDA food um, and also the rising cost of food, there, the food bank has not been able to source us or provide us with many of the key staples that we are accustomed to getting um, free of cost from them. And the other kind of issue that it relates to the numbers really have been those cuts in pandemic snap that have happened. Um, the last estimate that I saw was that the reduction in SNAP amounts to more than $260,000 in SNAP benefits lost every month to Amherst residents who are enrolled in SNAP, um, not even including those who are eligible but not enrolled. Um, and so to really to meet this demand and compound that, we have successfully added another evening. That was one of our goals that we had laid out for this contract year. So we, our food pantry is now open um, both on Tuesday and Thursday evenings until seven o'clock on site and with curbside pickup until 7.30. Um, we have also added um, new delivery households and are on track to add some additional Amherst delivery routes as well to increase access there. Um, and we have really increased our food purchasing. At this point, we're spending about four times as much on food each month than we were earlier in the fiscal year, just to ensure that we have key staples like tuna and peanut butter and beans and grains um, in stock while we're navigating those food shortages. Um, that's something that we are able to do in the short term, um, but it's certainly not something that we're able to sustain um, long term. And so we're really continuing to figure out our, our options and sourcing potential and funding options um, moving forward to sustain that. Um, we have already well exceeded the number of Amherst residents that we projected to serve in the contract. And obviously there are still um, a couple months left and uh, we did expand uh, several months ago to the full two weeks of food, um, which was by adding that second monthly delivery of fresh boost or sorry, second monthly shop or delivery of um, produce and eggs and cheese and milk. Um, and that has been really, really popular. Folks are really enjoying that and appreciating it. And it really serves a core mission of 
of course, we want to provide quantity of food, but we really want to provide um, quality and nutritional food and uh, providing more produce. And those items are some of the ways that we've been able to have a good kind of culturally diverse array of options and also foods that folks can select and prepare in ways that works for them and that are healthy and really good. So that's been a really great win. Um, and uh, we have also continued our focus around language access at the pantry, um, reinstituting a bunch of the different pieces that had, I don't want to say had been lost during COVID, but definitely had like we're happening with varying degrees of consistency, maybe is the best way to put it, or just some of the things. And so um, with more people coming on site and with Detroit shopping and just so many more volunteers, we've really been able to um, reintroduce a lot of those initiatives. Um, so I feel incredibly grateful to uh, the CDBG committee for your support and also to just a truly phenomenal team of volunteers and staff who have been endlessly creative as we're kind of continuing to navigate on a week to week and month to month basis how to meet these rising challenges um, and uh, also feel really humbled by the level just this over and over and over again um, rise in rise in need that we're seeing um, so yeah that's kind of where things are at and I'm more than happy sorry I wasn't watching the clock but I'm more that's than okay. happy to take any questions. Just a over, you're fine. Um, I was going to ask do you imagine a time when you'll start making meals again and and being able to have people in for meals? Oh um, we uh, never stopped making meals. But um, I mean having we, like having a, a community meal in Yes, Sunday. and we reopened the dining room for indoor community meals last October. Oh, okay. I think so. I'm, yes, I'm, no, our dining room okay. is open and busy and bustling. We have community programming again. We um, have had several fabulous uh, live music events. Um, we have another one. Now I can't remember if it's this Friday or next Friday that we um, have a performer coming in. Um, our clinic, medical clinic, is back open and we've recently expanded the hours so no indoors at the center is 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 bustling and going oh, that's and great. i think we hear so much about the the program that you've been applying for to, or to for this yes season. totally it's been the pantry piece um so good i'm glad <laughs> yeah. to know somehow forgive me yeah no um no, 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 the no, CDC not, not funding good. is specifically focused on amherst yeah. residents accessing the pantry so that's what i tend to talk about yeah. here but um yes Happy to share updates about all the rest of it as well, if helpful. No, no, that's, good. That's, that's fun. I just, I'm glad, I'm glad to hear it. So, yeah. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? All right. Well, thanks so much, Lev, and thank you for your work. Yeah. And actually, is there, could we come in and do a, a little tour of the center and? You can come for lunch, we'll come um, for lunch and perfect. also a tour okay. and also to see the food pantry in okay. action. Yes, uh, we would love to have you. So let's, uh, let's check in and find a, Will you email or do you want yeah, me to Yeah, we'll be them? we'll be in touch with you. Okay. Yep. Perfect. That okay. sounds great. Yes, we would love to have you. Okay. Thank you. Good night. I think Amherst Community Connections had their hand raised next and we'll promote you to panelist. I'm going off screen for one sec, but I'm here. Hi, good evening, everybody. A little bit of technical difficulties here, so I'm glad that I figured this out. Hello, Rika, Suzanne, Becky, Lucas, and Nate. And Nate, I have two Nate here, Nate Larson and Nate Malloy. Thank you so much Nat, for having Nat us here. <laughs> Nat and Nate. It's very hard for me to hear the difference. So uh, thank you so much for having me here tonight and uh, really appreciate the Family Outreach of Amherst and Survival Center for the work they do. Because we send our folks 
there to receive their service. We have a resource center and uh, we connect them with resources out in the community. So for example, the ARPA money for the town emergency funds uh, channeled through the family outreach of Amherst. So on, on average, every month, we send about five families, individuals or family with, you know, family members to receive their ARPA uh, emergency funds. And I have to say that our caseworkers have such great review of their service. For example, we have one participant had a hard time trying to make her case about why her loss of income recently tied to COVID-19. It felt like COVID has been a long time ago. But it turned to find out that she had long COVID and she could not go back to work. So Francine over at the Family Outreach of Amherst, just willing to dig in further and further and finally was able to come up with a statement that's true and also legit. So I want to give a shout out to the Family Outreach of Amherst, treating our participants who are referred to them from the Amherst Community Connections and help them receive the funds that they so desperate need. And speaking about the Amherst Survival Center, it's almost part of our program. Feels like if we find somebody need a meal, the first thing that came to mind, not, not breathe alone, where I used to run the program, but it's the Amherst Survival Center. Go down there to pick up a hot lunch or go there to have lunch there. So I want to really appreciate my colleagues providing this very essential services to residents of Amherst. And what we do is something a little bit different. So uh, we basically is a social service program helping people access money, access housing. These are the two biggest things that we do through the CDBG grant. So money, we talk about raft application. So on average, we send about 15 people, apply, complete the entire process for their rent arrearage or for moving cost. As you know, if you live in Amherst long enough, you know Caymans is the biggest real estate property management company. And their rule of thumb is unless you make four times of the monthly rent, they are not going to rent to you. So many people who need to rent, but they have a housing voucher, but they can't have that kind of money. So what we do is don't worry. We go to the wayfinders because you know our Amherst residents, they are in the catchment of wayfinders. So through the raft funding, they are able to secure first month last month and security. That's three months of rent. Now for an apartment, one bedroom, the going rate right now, it's at least $1,200 for one person or one couple. Who has that $3,600 sitting around, especially if you have Section 8 voucher? You are income eligible. That's why you get your Section 8. So we are so pleased. Money talks. In this case, on average, we send about 15 families, individuals to apply. So we are able to complete the entire application from the beginning to the end after we figure out all the pieces of puzzle, such as if they don't have a birth certificate, we need to secure the birth certificate. If they don't have money to pay for it, we dig into our pocket, come up with the $25 to apply for birth certificate so that they can complete the raft process. So having money, have access to funds, we are really happy because it allow us to do the work that we need to get done in order to save them from being experiencing housing instability. So that's one thing, raft funds and the emergency funds by those two agencies. And we have a new phenomenon I want to share with you. And I- So Waylon, we're, we're yeah. just at five minutes. So um, a, a quick share and then- Sure. And then, thanks. Great. Wonderful. So the final piece I'd like to share with you is about the um, UMass spillover effect on the town of Amherst. 
we have so many undergraduate students, graduate students, they are behind on rent. And they don't live on campus. These are students who could not afford, who could not find housing on campus. So they would go into the community. So they compete the housing that we have for the residents and they cannot find affordable housing. So they find housing for a one bedroom apartment, $2,300 for two people to squeeze in. And yet after three months, they cannot afford the rent, for example. So they come to us for help and graduate students, same situation. So it's a problem that we do as much as case management as we can, but the crux of the matter is we just don't have the housing for both students and for residents. So that increase the demand for housing, increase the need for our service. And we are at the busting point that every caseworker, we have 11 of them, they have 27 cases. So we are having a hard time making sure everybody, you know, get that service that they need to avoid being evicted. So thanks again for really yeah. give us the funds we need. We really appreciate. And if we were to come and would it make sense to come and speak with caseworkers also that's I hate to take them away from their 27 caseload person caseload but you know it it's so important for them to meet with town officials to talk about what they do without mentioning names because these are young people have the ambition they want to help the world and by you coming to see us asking us questions it shows that you value their work. So in the course of a day, we might have one or two interns. They are interns inspired to become social worker. They will be more than happy to sit with you and me, ask questions, and they share with you what they walk away with for this two semester, 12 hour a week of commitment. So I would love to and want to invite every one of you, Rika, Suzanne, Nate, Becky, Lucas, and Nat, Please come. Okay, we'll be in touch to set that up. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you so okay. much. Bye bye. Good night. Good night. Bruce, I see your hand raised, um, but Big Brother, Big Sister had, I lowered their hand just so they wouldn't be raised for a long time. We'll promote Susan. You can become panelists and then we'll move on, Bruce, to you. Hello, everyone. It's great to see you all tonight. And yes, I, yes, and um, yeah, again, I'm Susan DeCastro, director of Big Brothers Big Sisters of Hampshire County. We're as always uh, just so appreciative of the support that you all provide that makes our programming possible. And yeah, also we would welcome a visit any um, anytime with the committee. We have our offices that you know who are. I've uh, been set up in Hadley for the last year and a half now, and but we'd also be happy to meet anywhere in the community that you would like to meet. And we're really proud to have, you know, our, our staff has, you know, we, after going through quite a bit of transition, we're really pleased to have a, you know, very well-established staff with our three case managers, our program supervisor, our director of um, our development and manage, uh, development and relationships manager. And yeah, so we're kind of a fully assembled team and we're, you know, always happy to uh, just welcome the ability. Um, we can come rock climbing with you on Friday. What, what's that? We can come rock climbing with you on Friday. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm glad that you, yeah, that's one of one of our um, many partnerships that we've been developing yeah, is um, giving opportunities for our matches to climb at um, at the rock climbing gym in Hadley. So yeah, you could join, join in on that. Um, yeah, and that this this past quarter we've served 53 children and families. Um, I'm sorry, 43 um, children and their families. And yeah, we've been making steady progress over the year with um, all the support we've been providing to our ongoing matches and continuing to make progress in setting up new matches. And you know, I think a lot of um, yeah, our continued progress has to do with the strong partnerships that we have set up with a variety of um, services and supports in the community. 
Um, one that I wanted to highlight in particular is um, with UMass Amherst, our um, partnership with the Community Engagement and Service Learning Department. Um, we've been offering a class uh, through that department for many years. And, um, you know, the pandemic really, you know, interrupted the, you know, the group programming that we were providing through that class, but we managed to keep it going through doing community-based matches. And um, we're doing a lot of planning for the course this coming fall. And we actually had 76 UMass students who signed up for our recent info session, which um, was a great way to engage more students to sign up for the class. And the more students who sign up, the more interest we have in potential mentors who are gonna come on board to um, be mentors as part of that class. So we're really excited to see kind of those numbers really coming back with students, um, UMass students stepping up to show their interest in mentoring. And so, yeah, that makes us really confident about, you know, having, you know, having the, the recruitment wave that we need to, you know, to continue to address our waiting list and provide more and more um, qualified mentors to, to children at Amherst. Um, yeah, so that was just exciting to see a large group of students, you know, coming forward. And that, that was just a few weeks ago. We also have reestablished partnerships with some of the um, the campus groups. We have a um, reestablished partnership with um, the uh, a student organization through the Eisenberg uh, Business School, and they've come on board to help us with a couple of our uh, match activities that we've been hosting. Most recently, two weeks ago, we had. Um, a field day and egg hunt activity right on the UMass campus. And it was a lot of fun. We had um, over over 40 kids and 27 adults who signed up to participate. And that um, student group at UMass led, um, with, along with our staff, a variety of field day activities and um, pizza together and uh, you know really fun egg hunt. So it was a really great afternoon of um, you know, being able to you know showcase our program to the UMass UMass students who didn't know about us, as well as a you know this large group of volunteers who who helped out as part of their community service beyond being mentors, you know, wanting to help with our group programming as well. So we're really excited to be growing that. Um, student groups also um, volunteered to do our gingerbread uh, workshop that we hosted in December, and we, that also attracted a really large group of our matches who came together to celebrate the holiday season with um, gingerbread decorating and um, some holiday crafts. So yeah, so we're just excited to, that, to be reestablishing a lot of partnerships that, you know, had been interrupted during the pandemic and to have those, you know, really going strong and really flourishing this year. Um, and I just wanted to highlight, you know, some of the, you know, the families that we're serving and, you know, the level of need that we see with the families that we're serving. Um, we had, you know, Amherst family where we had several, um, there were two sisters who, uh, actually three who had matches. Um, and then it came to our, <clears throat> came to our attention through actually one of the mentors reporting to us that her, um, her little had reported some physical abuse happening in the family. And as a result of what the mentor reported, you know, we got DCF involved and DCF actually provided very supportive and helpful services to the family and actually didn't interrupt, you know, because we're always concerned that how will our role as mandated reporters potentially interrupt our relationship with the family, but um, we were really pleased that our relationship was not interrupted and actually we saw many positive services happening for that family as a result of the report and the, you know, the new um, supports that came into the family as a result of that whole process, as difficult as it was. Um, you know, You're so that was- five minutes, Susan. Oh yeah, okay, well, um, yeah, I'll wrap it up. Yeah, the last thing I was gonna say is, you know, just, you know, seeing a lot of, you know, many kids with, you know, mental health issues and, you know, still, you know, isolation from, you know, the result of the pandemic and, you know, anxiety and you know, things that make, you know, having a mentor that much more helpful and really, you know, integral to their functioning, that a mentor coming into their lives and, you know, helping to interrupt some of the isolation and anxiety that we see more and more kids experiencing. Um, yeah, so I, I'm happy to answer any questions and thank you again for providing these resources that, that are really helping our program continue to grow and flourish. So thank you so much. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? All right. Thanks, Susan. Great. Right. Thank you all so much. We'll be in touch about setting up a time. Sounds great. Wonderful. All right. Take care. Thank
And so Bruce is going to come in and give an update on the um, the town projects, right? Uh, Amherst Housing Authority. Yeah. I can speak for the town. Oh, okay. Oh, he just yes. okay. Hi, Bruce. Hello. Thank you uh, for inviting me. This is uh, this has been great to hear all that's going on. And um, am I you hearing me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it's my first time uh, to one of these meetings. Although we've been um, the beneficiaries of CDBG support in many different projects um, at the Housing Authority. So I am uh, Bruce Budrick, Director of Facilities for Amherst Housing Authority. Um, we have many, many houses, um, housing units that we support. Um, this particular one is our federal property. We only have um, this this one federal property. It's 15 family units at uh, on Main Street at Watson Farms. Um, when I came on board about a year ago, um, they were just getting ready for their big REAC inspection. They were getting ready to do... Um, uh, you know, have the HUD was going to come in and, and and do their inspection. And I had just come from doing pre-REAC inspections for a company called U.S. Housing Consultants, um, covering from Washington, D.C., Buffalo, New York, up in New Hampshire, training, uh, teaching these people how to pass these inspections. So I came on board and it was two weeks from an inspection. And I looked at the siding at Watson Farms and it was in horrible shape. I'm like, there's no way we're going to pass this inspection. <laughs> um, and fortunately, uh, my predecessor, Chad Howard, had um, worked with you and um, had a grant come in and we were getting ready for this siding project, but I had to invest thousands of dollars to repair this worn out siding to pass the inspection, even though we had this big, huge siding project going. So um, hopefully you've seen the reports as well for the siding project um, that we just now are wrapping up. It's, uh, it, it, it got moving right through the winter since we had a nice mild winter. And so it's very important to, to us that we uh, fix the whole building envelope because we just put new siding on, we'd hate for the buildings to be falling apart with the roofs in bad shape. So what we're looking at now is putting all the new roofs on and um, this is moving along very nicely. We um, fortunately, because of the funding you're providing, we're able to um, get these roofs done because we spent so much of, uh, well, we spent all of our HUD capital funds for the siding project, uh, three years worth of capital funds, plus a lot of our reserves along with your grant. And uh, we were able to get the siding done. So we, there's no way we could do the roof without this grant. And uh, it's very important because it had already started to leak. And uh, it's in, you know, um, you can see it already starting to buckle and it, it, it just needs to be done. Um, and as far as a, um, a, a tour, I would love to give you a tour of the, the siding, you know, that's been done at the, at the facilities. There's, there's um, seven buildings there. And uh, the roofing is just getting ready to start. So we are actually working with, we, we had the uh, bids go out. We, uh, we have the low bid was JD and D construction. We've been working with the project manager, uh, Jacek, o I don't know how to say his name, Ochaki, I guess. Um, but we've been working with him. Uh, he's definitely uh, been doing this before. Um, Roy Brown is our architect. And he's been kind of getting all the submittals and they've been going back and forth, approving everything. So it's kind of exciting, get ready to go. The weather is, uh, you know, the perfect time of year to get this done. We were a little bit concerned about the timing of the project because this these funds were really supposed to be spent by uh, June 30th. And so I was a little concerned because he was going to start the project a little late and I, I kind of coaxed him to Let's move it up. Let's move it up. So he, he's uh, actually just been submitting the schedule and we're going to be starting the project within the next few weeks. Um, really, it's it's kind of going as far as already picking the colors of the roof and things like that. Um, so um, actually, some he, I saw an email today. He's uh, got some deliveries coming on Monday, as early as Monday to start staging the project. So 
Um, we do need to get that uh, the sign up <laughs> over there, and uh, but it's exciting to be getting the uh, the building envelope done for these 15 families that are that are living there at Watson Farms. And uh, again, we're just very thankful for it. Uh, we'd love to, I'd love to, you know, arrange a meeting where we could we could show you around, see what we're doing, um, and then. Uh, it would be nice if it was a couple of weeks out. We had to actually had the roof going up. That that might be nice. Uh, but yeah, if we do it before then, that's okay too. You you can just see the shape the roofs are in now. Um, but you again, were you were you able to um, or have have there been significant leaks yet, or or is the roofing going on to, before people have before apartments themselves have been impacted? So I've been on board for about a year, and I, like I said, and I took over for Chad Howard, and he has had some patching done. So the the leaks that since I've been here, I have not seen any leaks. Right. So um, so the, it's good because we don't need any more damage uh, <laughs> going into the units. Um, as I did come on board, there was uh, one of the bathroom ceilings had a lot of. Um, I'll call it mildew. <laughs> so we had to get that remediated and repaired. We basically gutted that bathroom, had uh, a company come in and do the abatement for me. And uh, hopefully that wasn't from the roof. You know, we uh, it could have had some influence in it uh, previously, but we've got that place all, all fixed up now. Um, and so I don't believe we have any leaks now. They, they're not telling me if they are, and I'm sure they would tell me. Uh, <laughs> so... Um, well, point, we will absolutely take you up on your offer um, to come in and tour. And I think, you know, we certainly can wait until the roof is up and get the, or at least, you know, mostly up, um, you know, further into the summer. There is seven buildings. So, you know, it'll, it'll go in phases. Yeah. So, um, you know, you, it, once, once the first couple are done, you'll be able to get a good idea. Um, it, it, it's going to look really nice with the new, with the, all the new siding already up. We included with that project the, the soffits and the fascia. So it's really looking a lot better. Unfortunately, there was not enough funding to do the little sheds that are there. So we're gonna get our guys to try to spruce them up as much as we can with some paint and things. We, we didn't have enough funds to do the siding on the sheds. It was more important where the tenants were living, you know, to get that building envelope taken care of. Um, so yeah, we're, we're excited about it. We're thankful so much uh, that we can we can accomplish this. Great, thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Bruce? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for coming tonight. It's great to to um, hear how it's all going. Thank you very much. And um, I'm sure Nate or someone will be in touch with me about uh, a meeting and arranging a tour. Yep. Thank you. Great. All right, I think that is everybody. Nate, do you want to do a, a quick update on the town projects? <clears throat> yeah, there's two town projects. There's the sidewalks on Kellogg Ave, and then there's the trail at Hickory Ridge. And so the on Kellogg Ave, they've already started. They started uh, the other week. If you've gone by, they you know they're it's well underway. So that that project is moving pretty well. We bid it last year with um, a 2020 activity um, Mill Lane sidewalk. So Taylor Davis, we combined grant years and it worked out really nicely though just to be able to do that otherwise we'd probably just be awarding contract or get you know we'd be behind where we are so that that's going really well hickory ridge uh, is a little behind schedule the um every activity for block grant needs an environmental clearance and with staff change at dhcd and then ben leaving uh, staff change last summer and then ben leaving uh they never actually issued our environmental clearance for that one activity <laughs> It was they just realized it uh, in uh, at the end of March, and so we had to complete a, some more paperwork. And really, we can't do any physical work on the site until that is is cleared, which shouldn't be an issue. We're, we're actually um, doing finishing up the design and going through permitting in the next few months. Uh, so we're not it's hasn't delayed it too much, but we you know we have to kind of sit tight. Um, the hope is to finish all twenty one activities by the end of this calendar year. So the idea would be to get uh, someone on board starting in August or September on Hickory Ridge and actually installing the trail and have it be done by December 1. And so, you know, we have until, uh, like Bruce said, the idea was to try to get every activity done by June. We do have some, um, you know, an expenditure requirement by the end of the year, but I think all activities are moving so well that we're, we're in pretty good shape. You know, I think if something happens with Hickory Ridge, 
Uh, we'll know about it in the next few weeks. The HC will let me know, you know, based on the environmental review. Um, but you know, we had to follow something. It's in the floodplain, bend it all that. I feel like we're in really good shape to keep it moving forward. So nothing, you know, nothing of concern yet, but. Great. Um, so in terms of setting up um, the site visits, mm -hmm. um, I'm not quite sure. It seems like it might be, a, I don't want it to turn into a scheduling nightmare for, for Nate. And I wonder if it makes sense to, um, I don't know, like every month, say on some particular, you know, like the fourth, Thursday of each month or something that there would be something set up and everybody who can go can go. I'm picking that out of the blue. Um, but to try to do something like that or um, just to pick one and start there and then. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking that we'd kind of do um, be like a half an hour site visit for each activity. And then I could just set up a doodle poll with the committee and then I could confirm with the agencies what days are good. And just I would, I could, you know, I, I don't mind doing it. So I can. Okay. You know, try to get get that going. Right. Um, you know, maybe we could try to do two in an afternoon if people are free or something. Yeah. You know, we could have them be an hour and a half apart, just so that if one goes over, we have enough time to get to the other one. Um, yeah. That sounds great. And we would do the Monday through Friday. Is that what you're envisioning? Right. Right. So. Right. Yeah. I mean, okay. for instance, if you know Wednesdays is better or not for the survival center, for instance, right? If they're too busy getting ready, yeah. then we could do like a Thursday afternoon, and then maybe we pair that with. You know, family outreach and you know, Main Street housing is not too far from family outreach, so we could go then and see Watson Farms. You know, and it'd be pretty. We could try to coordinate that way. All right, that's terrific. Um, so what we thought we would do is, um, we won't plan a, a time right now, but we'll probably meet again sometime in um, late September, early October, um, just to kind of touch base, um, see where we're at, um, because the funding we, cycle we just did is to covers two years. We sort of have this strangely long period of time. Um, we are, I know Greg's not here tonight, but I'm assuming he's still with us as a, a committee member because he hasn't said otherwise. Um, and But I think we do have an open seat. So if anybody knows anyone who's interested, I think that that's still, and I, um, so that's, that's there, but not a lot of heavy lifting um, for a while. And does anybody have, have any updates or? Anything they want to talk about? Yeah, I was going to say we can meet as needed. It may be that, you know, depending on what feedback we get with Hickory Ridge or, you know, that money may need to be reappropriated. And then uh, September would be a good time or October to meet again. That's when we typically get under contract for the new grant that we applied for this winter. So, you know, we may just want to meet just to have another startup meeting, even if we're not, you know, getting ready for another outreach process for a grant application just to kind of get together and talk about the new grant and you know I don't, I'm not sure what you know what changes will be had but right we never really had this two-year cycle before um, so you know DAC might have some other requirements in terms of just you know public follow-up or some meetings uh, throughout the year so all right yeah that sounds good I thought it was helpful to have that kind of schedule this year Well, thanks everyone. All right. Well, we'll look forward to hearing about the schedule yeah, and the doodle right. poll. Thanks for taking that on. Thank there. you. All right. Yeah. Appreciate right. it, Nate. Thanks. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.